Good evening. Um, we are lucky today to have Dr. Tom Howard with us talking about overtraining. Um, Dr. Howard went to Uni United States Military Academy at West Point and um, went on to have, sorry, um, went on to train further at the Uniformed Services University of Health Science School of Medicine and completed his residency of family practice at DeWitt Army Community Hospital, and then was a primary care sports medicine fellow at the US UHS and Notional Orthopedic Sports Clinic in Arlington, Virginia. He was a residency director of the family practice residency and department chair of family practice at DeWitt Army Community Hospital prior to his retirement from the Army in 2004 after 29 years of service. After retiring, he practiced at the Fairfax Family Practice in Virginia as a program director for a sports medicine fellowship and a busy sports position where clinician, excuse me, where he developed a comprehensive program for diagnostic musculoskeletal sonography and regenerative medicine. He left Northern Virginia and joined uh, North Carolina State Student Health in February 2015, and then joined Phlenogenics in June of 2016. Dr. Uh, Howard is going to talk to us today about overtraining, and he is definitely an excellent candidate to give this talk. He has more publications uh, than I am able to list in this time and has written multiple chapters on overtraining and some of the books that most of us uh, refer to regularly, including the complete um, book of running medicine, just the facts, up to date, ACSM, sports medicine, comprehensive review, running medicine, and Netter's um, Elsevier sports medicine. So some uh, pretty impressive chapter writing there and has presented at all our major conferences uh, in sports medicine and in uh, uniform services. So I'm, we're thrilled to introduce Dr. Howard and when you're ready, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. So um, we, I have a normally, which is a, a fairly long lecture that we're gonna try and squeeze down into a short time frame uh, so that we can get it done within the, uh, the time we have allotted. But what I want uh, it's not advancing. I'm gonna interrupt for a second. Okay. I forgot to mention that if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll address them when we can. So what we're gonna talk about, uh, I wanna talk about obviously terminology. We're gonna talk about the etiology and the epidemiology. And we'll talk obviously most important for us clinicians, uh, talk about the presentation how we would uh, uh, work it up, uh, work through the differential diagnosis, the man management and prevention of, these, uh, of this condition. Um, as you know, when we train, we're trying to overload or stress ourselves to the point that we create a stimulus that we can adapt to improve our performance. And adaptation is that, imp that physiologic response that allows us uh, to perform better in the future. In order to adapt, we have to recover. Um, recovery starts when we, we displace this homeostasis. And it, but it, we have to think about recovery as not just physiologic, but there is there's psychological recovery and even social recovery. You think about the components of recovery, you could break it down into nutrition and hydration and rest and sleep relaxation, uh, emotional support, stretching and active rest. We can't just say stay immersed in our sports because uh, we'll eventually start to fatigue just emotionally. If you think about the athlete, a lot of us, we live in this world. This is where we see the athlete participate in their sports with their coach, their team. But don't forget, they have a home situation, whether they uh, they're have siblings and children or parents, uh, and they, uh, in most cases, are working. And so they have these, this three-tiered uh, list of different stressors uh, on them, in addition to participating in the sport. So fatigue is, is the presenting symptoms when we see patients that uh, we think are, or suspect are overtrained. But we can define fatigue sometimes as physiologic in the sense of we expect fatigue if there's inadequate sleep, jet lag uh, in pregnancy, if there's uh, excessive competition and overreaching, and we're gonna define this term in a minute, and even nutritional deficiency. 
as opposed to pathologic fatigue, um, where now I have uh, some infectious or neoplastic problem, where they have a metabolic condition or some other uh, conditions that is part of the differential diagnosis that it's really up to us to try and sort through. Uh, is it really that they're overtrained or over overreached, uh, or is there something more serious uh, going on? The athletes, when they and their coaches, when they design their schedules, uh, they they design periods of increased stress and let decreased stress uh, such that they can manage this recovery process and, and hopefully prevent uh, these uh, overtraining uh, stresses and, uh, and loss in performance associated with it. So what is functional overreaching is a term we use for uh, athletes will have a lot of the symptoms of overreaching uh, that it usually follows a, a, an acute uh, phase of increased training intensity and duration where they have a uh, clearly have a deterioration in performance, whether it's a self-assessment or some time trial or other assessment tool. They feel fatigued. But the important thing about functional overreaching is that it resolves rather quickly if they, if they rest or change the level of their intensity. And then non-functional overreaching is a term that's used for uh, this, this junction between when they're really overtrained and if they're just functionally overreached. And really it's similar type decreases in, in performance, uh, but the recovery may take up to a month to six weeks. And yet they do recovery, recover in a relatively short period of time. <coughs> And overtraining being, again, uh, this maladaptive response to training, but uh, the recovery is, is much, much longer and in fact can take uh, months to, uh, to uh, years to recover. It's oftentimes associated with overuse injuries, uh, significant mood disturbances, blood chemistry changes that we're gonna discuss and immune dysfunction. If you think of the overtraining model, you know, we train to, to increase our performance. If we become overreached, uh, we get into this, this period where we have a decrement in, in, uh, in performance. If we adequately respond to this with relative rest, we can increase our, our, our capacity. But if we can't, we uh, continue to decline because we haven't adequately respond, responded to this, these symptoms associated being overreached. So what's a common uh, scenario that we see is someone is overreached. Uh, they have a decrease in their performance. Uh, they fail to regenerate. And so they get into a panic and I must not be doing enough. I need to train harder. I need to train longer. And they push themselves over the top to where they can't recover. And another terms that you find in European literature about this is people will define it as under recovery syndrome or training fatigue, but I, I like this under recovery, uh, implying that a lot of what we're gonna talk about as far as treatment and uh, monitoring and such is all about trying to improve and monitor recovery. So this is the oldest reference that I found when I first started doing some research in this, but this is from the predecessor to the New England Journal of Medicine back in 1923. And Dr. Parmenter described this overtraining or staleness uh, way back then. And to be honest, there's not much more to it. It is just what he described a uh, hundred years ago in, in the New England Journal. So, research findings, there's no specific diagnostic criteria, although I'll show you some research uh, that is showing more promise in uh, being more specific and making a diagnosis. But many of the studies that you read with it, there are very small numbers. Uh, it's really hard to establish controls or lab models. Uh, and many of the studies are just too short in, in duration. And then you have confounding influences in the subjects uh, with illness and injuries, uh, menstrual issues, 
uh, and different training methods and their different responses within the athletes and the ability to be able to generate a, a, a consistent model that you can reproduce. It's estimated that as many as 20% of the elite athletes at any one time uh, are overtrained. Uh, and two thirds of elite runners uh, will, in some uh, point in their career, experience overtraining. Oftentimes, we see this in the endurance events, and in particular, swimming, running, and cycling, as well. You see most of the literature about uh, overtraining. There is overtraining in powerlifting, and certainly we can see it in other competitive sports. Uh, it probably is a little different, uh, and a lot of the focus I'm going to do is more the endurance. Uh, activities that we're going to talk about with respect to uh, this condition. There may be some uh, predictability. Uh, the profile of mood states, I'll talk more about it later, but it is a, uh, a tool, a, a questionnaire uh, that can sometimes identify individuals uh, that are more predisposed uh, to overtraining. Uh, there may be some those athletes who are designing their own training program <clears throat> and scheduling their own competitions, they may be more subject to this than uh, those uh, with a, a coach who is actually monitoring their progress and their, and their performance. The risk of this, and we've seen this in, our, in various athletes that we've covered, but poor performance during key events like an Olympics or a state competition, injuries, illness, and then unfortunately, premature retirement from the sport. So hypotheses, there are, there are several hypotheses that are out there uh, right now. And I'm gonna go through them briefly. And all of these hypotheses, they came up over the last 20 years to try and explain uh, some of the clinical findings, as, as well as some of the uh, biochemical and laboratory findings that we see in these individuals that are overtrained. And I'll just cut to the chase that uh, we're going to end up saying, you know, the most perceivable theory that, that really makes sense nowadays, the modern theory is this cytokine hypothesis. <clears throat> now, the branch chain amino acid uh, hypothesis or the amino acid disbalance theory, it... Uh, it, the idea is, is that sustained exercise creates a, a glycogen deplete state and that the body then will start using branch chain amino acids as a fuel. And this branch chain amino acid consumption can change the, the ratio of branch chain amino acids and free uh, tryptophan in the brain. And with this, there you get increased levels of tryptophan and therefore serotonin in the brain, and it leads, can lead to central fatigue. Uh, the problem is, is that may ex explain central fatigue, but it doesn't explain a lot of the uh, physiologic findings we're finding in the, in the rest of the, of the body. There's an automatic imbalance hypothesis. Um, where prolonged strenuous exercise leads to increase uh, catecholamines, cortisol, T3, and other stress hormones. And this actually down, down, down regulates the adrenal receptors. And peripherally, it, it creates a lower sympathetic resting tone peripherally, and it can also increase brain tryptophan and hence fatigue. The glycogen uh, depletion hypothesis is, is strictly a nutritional hypothesis. Uh, this uh, inadequate energy intake, as well as loss of glycogen supplies, can uh, uh, create a release of some of the stress hormones, cortisol and such, and, and uh, decrease the resting testosterone. Many of the findings that we see in these uh, 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 overtrained athlete and leading to uh, fatigue. Uh, the one problem, and, and I've, I found a study, and I, I don't think I cited it here, but they actually did this. They looked at the glycogen levels in uh, wrestlers at the, towards the end of the wrestling season, and uh, they found uh, a pretty much uh, near complete. Uh, all the, all the, the wrestlers on the, on the survey uh, had decreased uh, glycogen levels, and that none of them really were overtrained. 
So it doesn't explain, it may cause a little fatigue, but it doesn't explain overtraining. The glutamine hypothesis uh, is trying to focus on how can I explain some of the immune effects that we see associated with overtraining. And so again, chronic exercise with inadequate uh, cre recovery creates this a glutamine deficiency. Um, and then it creates immunologic open windows for infection. Now glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in the, in the muscle and plasma. It's, it's synthesized by muscle, lungs, liver, brain, and fat tissue. And it regulates the acid-base balance as well as it's a, it's a nitrogen precursor for uh, nucleotides. Uh, and it's also a, a fuel for lymphocytes and macrophages and natural killer cells. And so in a glutamine deficiency, you can see that there can be effects on the immune function. There's a linear relationship uh, has been demonstrated between plasma and glut glutamine, uh, glutamine and exercise intensity uh, such that glutamine will decline as the intensity goes up. Uh, and it may take considerable time to recover this. Um, there was one study that was done that showed 50% uh, re reduction in resting levels of glutamine in athletes after a 10 day overload training period. The confounding factors with glutamine is it varies in us anyway. Uh, and there certainly can be dietary uh, uh, changes to your glutamine levels as well as infection will, will decrease your glutamine levels because of the consumption by the uh, white blood cells. So the, the, most, uh, the, the theory that makes the most sense and that uh, most people are hanging their hat on nowadays is the cytokine hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that uh, in, within the muscles, you have adaptive trauma, microtrauma, part of the training uh, cycle that creates a local inflammatory response. If there's inadequate recovery, this acute inflammatory response can lead to a chronic inflammatory response with release of systemic uh, immune and inflammatory uh, uh, products that can cause many of the effects. So if you talk, you talk, you see this cartoon here and you can see you have this muscle trauma and you have release of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, in particular, interleukin-1 one one beta, uh, tumor necrosis factor, and interleukin-6. Uh, and these are all pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines released by the muscles through the systemic circulation. They will indu uh, do, induce a, a sickness or the fatigue response in the central nervous system. It will inhibit the, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, various hormonal axes uh, in the brain. Uh, it affects the liver uh, as well as your immune cells. And this seems to make the most sense. Um, the, uh, the biggest, when you see studies about that, you'll see a lot of it is written about either all three of these or at least one of these where they have been affected. Uh, and in these overtrained athletes, you see changes in these immune uh, uh, cytokines. This was an old study in military medicine, but they took uh, 26 French soldiers and after three weeks of intense training, and they had decreased secretory IgA that we see a lot of the overtrained athletes as well as DHEA, prolactin and testosterone, but they had a significant injury increase in this pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine IL-6. This was uh, in med medicine, science and sports and exercise, again, uh, they were looking wrestling season and they were looking cytokines and growth factors. And they, uh, they saw a significant uh, increase in, in some of these inflammatory cytokines in, in this uh, group of wrestlers that rebounded after uh, the season. Um, this was another exercise that uh, looked again uh, uh, in medicine, science and sport and exercise. It was a while ago, but it uh, showed changes in inflammatory levels with intense exercise, but uh, actually increase in anti-inflammatory interleukin-10 with a balanced exercise program. And then finally, I found this in the occupational therapy uh, uh, literature, but they had uh, the, a group of people with repetitive uh, hand overuse injuries. 
And these repetitive hand use injuries induced a chronic inflammatory condition manifested by increased in pro-inflammatory cytokines. So how do they present? Well, the most commonly is they can't meet their performance standards. Uh, they, they, they note that their recovery is slower. They may have weight loss. Uh, they may notice an increased resting heart rate that we'll talk more about. Or they may have some overuse injuries that are repetitive in nature that brings them to uh, your office. Oftentimes they have some apathy, sleep disorders, and some emotional issues. Diagnostically, unfortunately, there's no specific diagnostic criteria or specific lab parameter where you can diagnose overtraining syndrome. And this is what I, when I've given lectures in the past and written, this is, has been uh, our, the feelings for years. Um, the differential diagnosis uh, is broad. And we talked about that pathologic fatigue and certainly part of it is up to us to uh, try and screen these patients and identify these metabolic problems and other systemic illnesses that may be the presentation of the fatigue and not that it's just that they're overtrained. This is what I was alluding to as far as diagnostic testing. There um, in the uh, late 19, uh, uh, 20, uh, the teens, uh, this uh, Katagiani and uh, Cotter, as well as several other colleagues, but a lot of the literature you'll see with Katagiani and Cotter, they, uh, this study, the Endocrine and Metabolic Response to Overtraining Syndrome, or the EROS study, they produced quite a few papers on overtraining out of this. And this is just one of those that came out in 2020. But they used a combination of clinical markers using some of the, and we'll talk more about the profile of mood states, but changes in these uh, parameters in the profile of mood state, dietary consumption of total protein, total calories, body fat mass, looking at these biochemical markers. And down here, this is the insulin tolerance test to measure the growth hormone, cortisol, uh, ACTH, and prolactin. But they reported that in using these uh, uh, group of tests that they could uh, eliminate the confounding factors and diagnose uh, overtraining 100% of the time. Problem is that most of us don't have access and don't use a lot of these tests in our clinical practices. So our medical evaluation obviously is, is designed to really ferret out those possible uh, um, pathologic conditions. So you certainly wanna have a good interview, talk about their training program. Um, and I'll give you one example. Whenever I hear from a, an athlete coming in who said they wanted to run a marathon, but now they're fatigued. And it's not uncommon, especially in less accomplished runners, that they may be wanting to run, to run a marathon and lose weight. And so anytime someone's trying to run and lose weight, that's a big red flag that uh, there probably is some nutritional issue. But certainly with the review of systems, your physical exam, we want to kind of ferret out all these uh, other conditions that oftentimes will exist. Usually lab-wise, I stick to base, very basic labs, getting a chemistry profile, uh, sed rate and a, and a blood count, thyroid functions, um, certainly beta HC, HCG in the women. And based on whatever your history and your review of systems determines, you may consider some other tests uh, to, uh, to, to uh, rule out certain conditions. Other things you could consider, again, based on the history, you know, maybe if you have access to the profile of mood state, uh, maybe you wanna refer them to a nutritionist because you think there are some nutritional issues. Maybe they need to see a sports psychologist. Um, maybe you need to do a drug screen because there's too much nightlife. So I really, this comprehensive physical, their dietary evaluation, talk about their, their diary um, and, the most important thing, the prescription for me is decrease intensity for two to three weeks. Uh, and sometimes just depending on the intensity of the athlete, it may be, you know, non-participation in their sport, 
sometimes you can get them to comply with decreasing the intensity and duration of their workouts for at least two weeks. When they come back, if they're uh, not improved, then either there is pathologic fatigue or uh, perhaps you've got someone, they have non-functional overreaching or are in fact overtrained. Uh, you may consider further testing. Certainly, I'm going to prescribe more rest. Um, if they're improved, then uh, they were overreached. Uh, they need to look at their training schedule, consider better periodization than tra training uh, schedule. Perhaps there was some issues with sleep uh, disorder, jet lag, or other conditions that may be uh, coexisting that we talked about in that physiologic fatigue. So management, well, the hardest thing for these athletes is, is that word, is rest. Uh, trying to tell them to slow down uh, to and really trying to get out of the stressful situations from their training uh, for a period of time, whether it's uh, two weeks, six weeks, uh, it is the hardest thing to do. Certainly, you're going to have to in, uh, get the cooperation from uh, their support, their family, their spouse, uh, their coach, for sure. Uh, and they can work on counseling. Uh, you may consider looking at diet. Again, we talked about the nutritional consult uh, and maybe doing uh, other studies to, to look for evidence of depression, whether it's primary or secondary to this uh, training fatigue. Some people, uh, there's some belief that branch train amino acid supplements may help in uh, mitigating energy and fatigue associated with exercise. Certainly it has shown that it, uh, by supplementing with branch chain amino acids, you can affect this uh, reversal in the tryptophan to branch chain amino acid ratio, uh, specifically tryptophan levels in the brain. You can improve profile of mood scores. However, uh, there's a limit to how much uh, you can tolerate. Uh, it's about five to 8% in, in, in uh, 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 oral hydration solutions. Beyond that, you can get some significant uh, uh, GI side effects. Um, some people have tried glutamine supplementation, but uh, there's been no demonstration of uh, any improvement uh, really in immune modulation. And uh, it, uh, it really is just essentially becomes another fuel, uh, but it's not been shown to be uh, beneficial. More important uh, is, is trying to prevent uh, this condition. Uh, and, you know, nutrition and their lifestyle program, the flexible programs, trying to control and monitor this recovery process. Uh, and then I want to emphasize this monitoring. With monitoring, it has been shown that the psychiatric indicators, that which you can see on various uh, uh, surveys and such, uh, they'll change before you have changes in performance deficits and certainly before you have changes in the biologic uh, markers. Uh, poor markers for uh, recovery, uh, body mass has not been found, shown to be uh, beneficial, certainly not serum ferritin levels or the CVC and, and certainly not uh, CK levels or the various hormones. Um, the resting heart rate uh, has been shown uh, to be a, a reasonable indicator for inadequate recovery. Um, remember we talked about the, uh, uh, that the psychiatric indica indicators will change uh, sooner than some of these other parameters so the profile mood state uh, can be beneficial. Certainly if you are testing cortisol and testosterone, you can monitor the ratio of the cortisol to testosterone ratio and looking for that, but this is not a, a value unless you have a previous uh, baseline tests on these individuals. And the same thing with following glutamine. And there's been shown that glutamine to glutamate ratio can really, uh, uh, monitor for this uh, recovery process, but this is, again, beneficial uh, in uh, this, the, the setting of having baseline tests. And then the heart rate variability at night uh, can be uh, 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 determined and, and followed as a monitoring tool. Um, 
again, it requires uh, some baseline testing and, and re the wearing of the monitor uh, overnight. Resting heart rate is that one uh, monitoring tool that many coaches will use and many runners uh, use. And it has been shown that, uh, that oftentimes when there's under recovery, there, there is this reversal of the uh, training related bradycardia that we see in awful, often in, in athletes. And so a lot of time, what people look for is about a, a 10 beat or 10% increase uh, in the resting heart rate might be an indicator that there's been an inadequate recovery from the recent training load. So we talked about the profile mood state. This is a 65 question, uh, question questionnaire. So it's not uh, something that you can administer real quick. Uh, it assesses these, these six scales, uh, five negative scales and one positive tension and anxiety, anger, hostility, fatigue and inertia, depression and dejection, confusion and bewilderment and vigor and activity. And uh, you can, uh, again, get baselines, but then you can monitor these as you go through a training cycle. Um, the, uh, these, this profile of mood state uh, may be able to predict, as I said in the beginning, uh, those individuals that may be predisposed based on their patterns within this uh, profile of mood state. Uh, this was a, a study that was done in military medicine a while ago, but uh, they, they looked at the effects of a four-day forced march on gonadotropin and mood state. And uh, what they found in this, there wasn't a big change in the, in, the, in the biologic markers, but they did see some pattern of change in their profile of mood state, indicating that this could be a reasonable monitoring tool in the absence of changes uh, in hormone, uh, uh, that hormones that are being monitored. Rescue sport is another uh, questionnaire that's out there. Again, it's still a fair number of questions, but again, it, it gives you these, uh, these various uh, stress scales and they're beneficial in the setting of, you gotta have a baseline uh, test uh, in the non-exercised athlete. I like this, uh, this total quality recovery, uh, and there's a, uh, there's a total quality, quality of recovery or TQR action where an athlete would self-assess how adequately did they hydrate, did they sleep and rest, did they relax, and did they stretch and do active rest, and could assign a point scale based on how well they think they did this. And then there is a perceived, uh, uh, recovery where they, in using a, a reverse Borg scale, they assess how, how well did they recover. And therefore they, in, in, in the setting of, I really recovered well, then they can train hard. And if they're not adequately recovered, they shouldn't train as hard. So I, my recommended uh, monitoring tools uh, is uh, certainly exercise diaries, uh, sleep patterns, monitoring the resting heart rate, uh, monitor this, uh, the TQR that we talked about, especially the TQR perceived. And then coaches a lot of times will use time trials, at least in running athletes, as uh, a, uh, a metric to, to track performance and, and identify uh, performance decrements as they uh, start. I think that's it. Uh, what I was going to talk about. And uh, I think we were going to open it up to questions. Uh, if not, I have a couple of questions uh, to ask the group. Uh, let's go ahead and ask your questions to the group and then uh, we can talk some more if people come up with questions as we go. Okay. Uh, Daniel, do you have those questions? Andy. Yeah, oh, Andy, yeah, I've got them. Uh, yeah, no problem. Get them ready to go whenever uh, you you're ready. Okay. Yeah. Let's go ahead and let's put up the first one. So, hypotheses for overtraining include all of the following, except the glycogen hypothesis, cytokine hypothesis, central fatigue hypothesis, mood distorter hypothesis, and autonomic imbalance.
So people, you can go ahead and click on what you think is the correct answer and um, it'll be collected. Okay, uh, is that enough time? So Dr. Howard, go ahead and, and give your explanation. So yeah, so the, the correct response is the uh, mood disorder hypothesis. Uh, we certainly talked about uh, the glycogen hypothesis was a nutritional theory and cytokine and they are uh, the the uh, different uh, theories. The autonomic imbalance uh, it, it was one of the theories that we talked about, uh, as well as the central fatigue hypothesis. But mood disorder certainly mood disorder is uh, is associated with overtraining, uh, but it's not specifically one of the identified hypotheses uh, when we talk about this condition. Andy, we could have the second question. Effective monitoring tools for overtraining or inadequate recovery include all of the following except uh, CPK levels, uh, resting heart rate, serum glutamine to glutamate ratio, the profile of mood states, and heart rate variability. So most everybody got that. Uh, the uh, CPK is really not a, a reliable monitoring tool. There's lots of fluctuations with that, with various conditions as well as exercise. Glutamine to glutamate ratio is is a an is a monitoring tool. However, as you recall, it is limited by uh, having baseline uh, testing before going through a training cycle. Uh, profile of mood states is a very very good monitoring tool. The only difficulty is a 65 question uh, questionnaire qu uh, question questionnaire, and uh, a little bit difficult to uh, uh, administer. Heart rate variability is uh, found a lot in the literature. It is a very good monitoring tool, but does require monitoring equipment uh, and then interpretation of that variability in, in the overnight trace to, tracings. And resting heart rate is widely used by, uh, by people to monitor this uh, recovery process, knowing that uh, an increase in the resting heart rate might be an indicator of inadequate recovery. Dr. Howard, I think that um, with so many watches coming out that can monitor your heart rate variability, that we're going to see more and more use of that. Uh, I think, I think so. To, and we're probably going to have to be able to interpret it for, for athletes um, more and more. And, and can we have the last question? Psychologic monitoring tools for overtraining and recovery process include all of the following except. So we, the profile of mood states, the total quality perceived, uh, MMPI, the recovery stress questionnaire or rescue, and the total quality recovery action. And we're just looking for the one that's not really a, an appropriate monitoring tool. So yeah, and everybody uh, got that uh, pretty much right. Yeah, MMPI is a very comprehensive long test and uh, not appropriate in this setting uh, as a monitoring tool. 
certainly the total quality recovery. Uh, if you recall, we talked about the total quality perceived and action. Action where uh, an athlete self-assesses uh, how much uh, sleep and rest, hydration, uh, and um, and emotional uh, recovery that they uh, completed during their recovery period, where total quality perceived is was that reverse Borg scale, uh, where uh, an athlete getting ready to go through a training session decide uh, self-assesses. I don't feel very recovered from yesterday's training session. I'm gonna work out lighter today, uh, as opposed to the, the individual that says, I feel great, I'm gonna push hard. You know, if you have a team, how can you use that? Uh, you know, I think that we do see a lot of individuals that have issues, but they're part of a team and how do you adjust the training for the team? Yeah, I, I, and that is that is uh, much more difficult uh, for the coach, um, but uh, I, I think you can find situations where, where the coach that is applying the same exact training program for every individual sometimes is going to have some individuals that cannot tolerate that. And... Uh, if the coach has the capacity to be able to individualize some of the training uh, such that, that some are pushed harder on some days and others not as hard, you're going to have a more overall better effort. Uh, but uh, team sports where the, the, the coaches are trying to uh, push team participation and everybody does the same thing, you're going to find athletes that are not tolerant of that. I'm also very interested in the hormonal axis of females versus males and looking at how the U.S. women's soccer team did follow their periods and looked at variability of training in relation to whether or not they were in a high estrogen state or a low estrogen state uh, and, and really changed their training to be more um, weight building, like uh, doing more weightlifting and more heavy pushing during the first half of their cycle and then more recovery in the second half and how it really did have a positive impact on how the team did and, and on their injury levels. And I'm hoping that as we move forward, we'll be able to incorporate that into, you know, trying to prevent overtraining in the female athletes. Yeah, no, I would agree. And I, those are great uh, observations that people have made. Uh, that, that contribute to uh, the whole, the, the body of literature as far as what's, what's the most effective uh, way to train. It's not just, let's go practice five days a week. Uh, it's, it's, you've got to mix it up you, and you have to be aware of the physiologic state of the individuals. And even taking it one step further, as I was saying earlier, is, is individualized uh, training programs. And certainly you have the more capacity as you go further up in the hierarchy of athletic participation and you get to the Olympic level and they're not all doing the exact same training schedule because they all have different capacities uh, to respond and recover. I'll give one, uh, one last example that's the, from the literature. The literature. Um, so there was a, a book written, uh, I have it, a signed copy from, uh, Neil Bascom wrote a book uh, in the early 2000s uh, about uh, Dr. Um, Roger Bannister's uh, accomplishments as he, to, to break the four minute mile. And at the time that uh, Dr. Bannister, uh, the few months before he was going to break the four minute mile, um, he was training hard as he could. He was a resident. He was also doing research in the hospital at that time. He had a very, very busy work schedule in addition to trying to train. And he noticed that uh, he was just felt flat. Uh, his legs felt heavy. His times were, were not improving despite training as hard as he could. And so he and a couple of friends took a week off and went 
rock climbing. And he came back after this week or 10 day uh, a period of rock climbing refreshed. And it was in the next weeks that he pushed forward and he was able to run his perfect mile to break the four minute mile. So it, it, it was a, a perfect example of overreaching uh, in, 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 uh, in a story that a lot of us know about. Dr. Howard, I had launched that last uh, poll question. Uh, if you can uh, see that there, I think most folks have answered it. So we'll go ahead and share that. Um, oh, I miss, I just minimized that. Oh, okay. how do I call that up again? I thought I only sent you three questions. My bad. Can you read the question to me? I, I, I minimized it. Uh, sure thing. It's uh, examples of pathologic fatigue include all of the following except a, overtraining, B, thyroid dysfunction, C, substance abuse, D, mood disorder, or E, overreaching. Yeah, so um, we, if you look at those, uh, we talked about pathologic fatigue uh, was overtraining and these various other conditions. Uh, and the one condition there that would not be listed as, as, uh, as a pathologic fatigue is the overreaching, implying that yes, they're fatigued, but it is something that will uh, recover in a very short period of time. But substance abuse and mood disorders and thyroid dysfunction, all are some of the examples of uh, pathologic fatigue. And certainly uh, what's not listed on there all the various uh, um, conditions, uh, uh, cancer, uh, other metabo metabolic disorders uh, that can uh, present in these athletes and you have to consider them in your differential diagnosis. Well, Dr. Howard, that was great. I, I really enjoy listening to you and talking about this. It's um, something that's definitely near to, close to my heart, um, taking care of kids and, you know, this whole generation of year-round sports and whatnot, we really are trying to balance all the stresses, every everyday activity, um, you know, the year-round sports and the demands of school and all that. So it's, it's nice to see some of the science and some of the theories behind things to be able to share with families and um, really encourage them to try and be more variable in their activity level and what they do um, and you know sort of teach appropriate recovery and and all the different aspects so i very much appreciate your your knowledge and insight and in sharing that with all of us today if no one else has any questions we can um, go on and enjoy and get a good night's sleep get a good night's sleep <laughs> thank you Thank you.